So what's off for today? Well, um, I bet these guys, even though they've worked on heaps of cases, mm -hmm. will each have one that really stands out to them for some reason. Right. Like what was the standout case for you on Water Rats? Oh, probably when my child was kidnapped, oh, I'd say. Yes, How could I you forget? Yes, that was a standout for me. I think he was kidnapped me. twice, actually. Yes, and which one stood out, though? <laughs> first or the second one? Um, well, the first time, it's always, yes, it still so. stays with you. The second time, it's, oh, first not again. First kidnapping is always a special one. <laughs> yes, that's so, right. right. Well, I've, I've managed to go around and ask everyone for a standout case in their career. Ah. That's fascinating. David, tell us about a case that stands out in your illustrious career, if there is one that you could think of. Well, I think probably the one that really sort of affected me very early on when I first came here was the Wall Street shooting. Um, okay, time that was there. a shooting of two young police young officers. police officers, and just walking up that street and seeing that car. Oh, so you, and, were, you were at the crime scene? Yeah, and just realising that that sort of execution style death that occurred there and what that meant for two young police officers who just came to see an abandoned car and then to die in that street and realise what that meant, not just for those two officers, which was you know, incredibly tragic, but the grief that was around the whole community, the grief that was around the police force and helping to just come bring that investigation from a forensic pathology point of view to some degree of certainty to be able to say we know what happened at a medical basis and yes, we are available to give that evidence in whatever follows in court. Because was that quite early in, in Vifham's history? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah. I mean, it happened really after, you know, I hadn't been here very long at all mm. and I'd been up the night before dealing with a police shooting issue and I had, my wife had driven me to work that day and we had driven past the end of Wall Street mm. and saw lots of activity but didn't know what it was. I arrived at work, my wife dropped me off and I walked into the office and they said, we need to go back to Wall Street. Mm. And I went, I've just sort of driven past that place. Mm. And then I was back there and I again didn't get home for, you know, the rest of that day and night. Yeah. Wow, and a, a great conclusion to that case, a successful well, conclusion to it in the end. Uh, it was one of those cases that's gonna live in the Melbourne history of um, uh, the, the whole saga that existed around those cases. It changed policing, it changed, changed policing. It changed so much yeah. uh, in the community at the end of the day. There's a number of cases actually, and most of them involve children, um, that seem to stick with me the longest. And but one of the ones that um, that I can't quite shake um, was one that I uh, investigated not long after I started. Mm. And um, I had, in investigating her death, um, I had to look through her own diaries and notebooks um, to get a feeling for her and, um, and what she'd been writing. And um, although I think I'm a pretty hard-faced <laughs> person, <laughs> um, I've you know, seen a lot of things, I had to uh, often put that down. Yeah. And uh, it took me a while to actually get through them because I found them so sad and yeah. so distressing. Um, yes. Then the things that are, you know, because it, that involved you know, looking, examining her, all of her mental health treatment yes. and uh, her family life. And, um, mm. and it's, you know, that's some of the things that children have to endure in their lives. It's, yes. it's pretty, um, it's an eye opener. And, uh, and it keeps you grounded in reality, I think. Do you have a, a standout case in your long and illustrious career? Um, uh, yeah, I can remember one case from the UK, and it's perhaps not that extraordinary, but it struck me at the time as being pretty amazing, and it was a good example of how multiple agencies can work together mm -hmm. in a really efficient way to get a good outcome. And so I'd done a case of a hit and run, um, you know, deceased person down on the side of the road, obviously been hit by a car, although that question wasn't 
so clear at first. So first of all, we had to make the diagnosis that the person had been hit by a car and that that was the cause of death. And then the question became, of course, who, who did it? And I found a, a really, really small fleck of green paint on this person's leg okay. and um, lifted it up with some, with some sticky tape and said to the police, would you like this? And they said yes. And this case was in Nottingham and I drove the 40 miles back to Sheffield after the case. And by the time I got back to Sheffield, they'd arrested somebody because this green paint had only come from an Audi TT and there were only three of them sold in the Nottingham area in yeah. the last 12 months. And he was the first door that they knocked on. So it was pretty amazing. Wow, that is amazing. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the Triple Frankston murders? Yes. Which, so that's probably, people talk about working in the mortuary and about solving a case. Yes. So um, about being, being part of solving a case. And, and we don't often do that. We just, as I said, one small cog to gather evidence and that's solved by many, many, many people. Um, uh, the Frankston murders were ones that was happening really, really quickly, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a really, really bad time. and. Um, one of the young ladies came in here and I assisted with that autopsy. And that's when we um, found in the wound a piece of skin. Yes. So that was, um, if you're gonna ask for one case that stands out as a, a, as a crime story, it's seeing that piece of skin. Now the piece of skin, actually hands. the piece of skin belonged to the assailant. So we looked at his, her hands, and you could tell it had a print on it, so it wasn't her hands. Mm. So um, we looked at her hands, it wasn't there, and we knew immediately that that piece of skin actually belonged to the assailant. That's amazing. So if the detectives, with all their wonderful detective work, could match that piece of skin, we knew that we had him, and we knew he was escalating. Um, so again, like people talk about that happening all the time, but in my long, long career, that was the only one time that I've been in the case where I knew that directly we had an actually impact, um, the pathologist, and we all had an impact in actually solving that crime. And you did, you absolutely did. And the yeah. detectives found Paul Denya. Yeah. And that was the skin. Piece of skin. So to be there in that moment, um, yeah, it's said, oh, I was um, to be a part of that. It is something that you feel like, that, you know, that you helped. Well, many stand out, but some stick with you more than others, I suppose. And one case which really um, has stayed with me was a case that I had quite early on when I started at the coroner's court, and it involved the drowning of a young boy at a Victorian suburban beach. And I suppose it, it had that broader significance in the sense that um, Australia is an island continent and it's a rite of passage over summer. Kids spend their summers down at the beach. Um, and in this case, this young boy had um, drowned just a, a, you know, a few metres off the beach and it was really, he wasn't able to swim. And so um, as a result of um, that investigation, it became clear um, for a number of reasons, including socioeconomic um, factors, he hadn't had the opportunity to learn to swim or very, very briefly had some lessons. Um, and um, he, he drowned when he was with a, a group of friends and it um, transpired that around the time when I was investigating that case, um, Life Saving Victoria um, had recently had uh, released a report which indicated that something like three out of five primary school students finishing primary school weren't able to swim to basic standards. And um, there'd been quite a focus of um, uh, campaigns over the years in respect of watching toddlers um, around pools and um, water safety, but less attention on older children. And in fact, drowning is the um, highest cause of death of children between the ages of 0 and 14. And so um, when it became clear in the course of the investigation um, that um, swimming lessons were not so much a, um, a, a given but really a privilege, it um, led me to make a recommendation in that case that swimming lessons should be made compulsory 
um, for primary school age children um, and that was really following the recommendations that arose from the, um, the contemporaneous life-saving Victoria report. A case that um, all of us worked on from 2006, so uh, skeletal remains were located in um, bushland in Victoria when a person was uh, clearing a path for uh, fire prevention. Um, there were, the full skeleton was there, it was associated um, with clothing, um, some personal effects, so things like a drink bottle, but also a noose. So it, it was apparent from the circumstances that this individual had uh, chosen to take his own life, but there was no hypothesis about who this person was or you know why they were, were there. Um, so we do, that's where the kind of forensic anthropology comes into its own to develop that information. So the age, the sex, the ancestry. Um, we work with the forensic odontologist, so the dentist looks at the teeth and he actually had evidence of um, restoration, so filling, so which means he'd been to a dentist. Um, we work with the DNA specialist, so you've spoken with Dadna and we were able to obtain a DNA profile. So we've got a really good yeah. sort of post-mortem uh, record, if you want, of this individual, but um, he remains mm. unidentified, which is terribly sad. And uh, he, his many features which should be identifiable, but because we don't have any sort of records of uh, a missing person to match with, uh, we can't we can't do anything at this so point. What sort of picture did you get? Did you get sort of an age range? Yeah, so he's a he's a young that is a male between you know I think it was twenty five and and thirty years old, wow. Caucasoid. Um, we gave him you know he wasn't a particularly interesting stature you know not unusually short or tall, Rich. but that you know he did have uh, as I mentioned the the evidence of the dental restorations. Um, there was no evidence of trauma. Probably not surprising, given the association with the with the rope. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just one of these sad stories where a young man, you know, ends up in that sort of situation, but is still unidentified. The other case which sticks in my mind is the recent case where um, a woman and her lover poisoned the husband with cyanide. Very rare; doesn't happen all that often but it was sipped to him while he was asleep, while he was drugged. So it was a drug to sedate him and then a drug to kill him. So that can happen, that can happen. But you must have been like... Yeah, we were, we were all over that. So, were, mean, our, so were our police colleagues who said, look, there's guys, something going on here. try harder. Yeah, so it's not just us, yeah. but we rely on information from police, from family sometimes, from, you know, people yeah. who, who are involved with the deceased. I guess for me, one of the, the big ones was um, the, the Black Saturday bushfires. I, I started working at the court not, uh, that year after the bushfires, so I wasn't here for, for all of the processes. Um, but once the Royal Commission had been completed and the coroner was making her findings, the, the state coroner at the time, um, I had just moved into my role then as a registry manager and we had to close all the cases before Christmas. So. Um, I was tasked with closing all, um, all the cases, mm. which is an administrative process. But for those, it was a lot, a lot of people. Um, and you had to look at the circumstances. So normally I can close a file without having to really get into the nuts and bolts of the case. So that's a bit of a self-care thing for, for people that work here is you can sort of separate yourself mm. in some way. I need to know the facts, and but I don't need to know everything. But with those, there were so many, um, I guess families that lost multiple members of their families and trying to sort of ensure that everybody who needed to get a finding got the finding. Um, so, uh, and also not sending three letters to the same person mm. in individually. So I collated them as much as I could. And, and um, the work that was done um, in the court in, that, in those years, I guess, because it took a while to get to that stage where we were closing mm. the cases. Um, the compassion of the staff um, and the impact that it had on everyone, it, it really, um, it just, it, it sort of underpins why we work here and um, also it was just a big thing for Victoria. It was, and those, 
those families. I mean, it was huge. And t next year's the 10 year anniversary. Um, and for some of us, it, it doesn't feel like 10 years really mm. at all um, because those cases still still stay with yeah. us. And yeah. It's part of Victoria's consciousness, isn't it? It, it that, absolutely that is, yeah. 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 Absolutely. yeah. But there's many cases that stay with us. And, um, you know, I, some, some people think that cases are a number and they're not. They're people and they're families. And sometimes I don't even know the case, but I know the family member. Mm. So, you know, we talk a lot about families and um, what, you know, what they're going through and how we can help them and yeah. Now you and Ned Kelly are inextricably linked, <laughs> aren't you? Both outlaws, obviously, in your own Ned ways. And Ned and I, yes. I tell you what, Ned has been a very big influence on my life since sure. 2009, yeah. I think is when it all first started. What happened? What started? Well, when Penta, the old Pentridge prison was being turned into a fancy block of flats. Can you believe which it that? Has been done. <laughs> and people can live there in the surrounds of what was one of the worst places to be held as a criminal ever. Mm. And part of that development, they had to dig up all the graves. And a lot of those graves included bones from people who had been executed right here yeah. and buried here, been dug up from here in 1927 or 29, and then taken out to Pentridge and reburied. So there was lots and lots of old boxes and hessian bags full of bones. Right. And amongst them, allegedly, were the bones of Ned. And we so were, do you think the, the bones got a bit mixed up and oh swapped yeah, they, around and yeah, stuff? Yeah, and just kind did. of We didn't know. Some skeletons were complete, some were incomplete. Right. Some had heads, some didn't have a head, some were sort of all over the place. And so the bones all came to the Institute and our lovely Attorney General at the time, Rob Hulls, asked us to find Ned Kelly. And at the same time, a fellow by the name of Tom Baxter handed in a skull that he had allegedly appropriated from this place in 1978 oh. and kept for 30 years in an old makeup bag on the banks of the Fitzroy River in a <laughs> hollow tree. Really? <laughs> Yeah, and bought out every now and then going, I've got the head of Ned Kelly and I'm not going to release the head of Ned Kelly until he gets a consecrated burial, etc, etc. So, oh, okay. so we got the skull and we got all these mixed up bags of bones and we were asked to work out whether that skull was actually Ned's and which of these bones were Ned's skeleton. And? That was really interesting. It was a long, drawn out, I could probably stand and talk for an hour about how the whole process went. But in the end, the skull was not Ned's, oh. proved by DNA. So this poor fella had been keeping Ned Kelly's skull <laughs> in his, in oh his no. makeup bag and it wasn't even it's Ned's skull. It's just a rando skull. Well, it was an executed prisoner skull, but we haven't actually found out whose skull it is yet. Yeah, so but not actually, famous. No, not, not particularly famous. No. Infamous. Well, Infamous. not even really. Uh, we did find his skeleton. You did find Ned? We found Ned. Have we you found got found Ned's head? Haven't found his head. So we've got everything but his head. His got head's a, still got out a, there. We've got a tiny bit of the back of his skull. But that's it, we haven't got the rest of his head, so his head's still out there somewhere. Dana, do you have a case that really sticks out in your mind? Maybe it was quirky, maybe it was frustrating. What's the one that really sticks out for you? Um, I guess one that perhaps has really touched me. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on the identification of Daniel Morecambe. Oh, wow. Um, so I remember as a young sort of PhD student, uh, actually being in Queensland at the time that Daniel disappeared and kind of been struck by the case and then finding myself all these years later um, working on the case and I guess trying to make sure that um, we could identify his remains so that they could be given to his family and then I guess there would be an outcome for that case after so many years. Dad, so no, that's one that's really touched me. Can I tell you I can't believe you were able to do that. None of us could believe it. I can't believe I'm meeting you, the lady who did that, because we, we knew that those remains had been there for such a long time. That area had been flooded. Yeah, for so you to be able to identify those remains was magical. So it was a, a collaborative effort. There was a number of um, organisations around Australia who were working on this case. We were one of them. Um, we did mitochondrial DNA testing, which is something that we can do and offer for cases to all our, our colleagues interstate. So they came to us to test samples using mitochondrial DNA to be able to match those remains 
to Daniel's uh, mother, but also his uh, siblings, because they would share the same mitochondrial profile. And so that, that evidence is used to then be able to identify those remains. So to be able to, I guess, I know people say closure, but to be able to say, look, these are definitely Daniel's remains, and then things can move on. Yeah. Um, you know, the person who committed the awful crime could be prosecuted. Um, so that, that to me is what gets me up in the morning. I am not surprised. That's amazing, Dadna. The investigation into the death of Miss A was um, a case that I was looking at and she died um, in a, um, a Hungry Jacks not far from here. Um, she'd purchased her heroin and gone and um, injected the heroin in a toilet um, at Hungry Jacks and was basically found unconscious. She was also a client of North Richmond Community Health so there was a connection there and basically we just started to think what can we do to um, to look at strategies of harm reduction in this area. How can we prevent deaths occurring around heroin overdose? There's a lot of people around that um, they don't choose to be heroin addicts. Um, it's just something that happens to them. I think what we're told is if they um, get a taste of it once, it's sort of there for a long time and it's very hard to stop taking heroin. So we need to, they are usually the most vulnerable people in our society as well. They, um, they some of them are homeless. Um, they, a lot of them don't have um, jobs. So there you go, Ned Kelly's head, a mm. favourite among a lot of people, obviously. But Dadna, being the lady who identified Daniel Morecambe's remains. Oh my God. Amazing to me. I know. Because I was in Queensland for that entire period and I did some fundraisers and stuff for his parents, so. Uh, just the, that photograph of oh him that they gosh. used all the time, those cheeks and oh my god. Yeah. How wonderful to have, to have a part of that, the solving of I that said case. To her, isn't that amazing? Does she feel that? She does, but again, she's so humble. Oh. She's this beautiful little lady sitting up there with her special teapot that she likes to bring to work <laughs> that no one else is allowed to touch. And she's just this humble, beautiful person. Yeah. Yeah. Just another well, one of those her. stories, yeah, isn't she great? A hero medal. Mm.